So now we begin on four classes on number theory. The purpose of taking it up now is that we're still practicing proofs and number theory is a, a nice uh, self-contained elementary subject as we'll treat it, which has some quite elegant uh, proofs and illustrates contradiction and other uh, structure structures that we've learned about. A little bit of induction and definitely some applications of the well-ordering principle. Uh, the ultimate punchline of the whole unit is to understand the RSA crypto system and how it works. Along the way, we will today actually establish uh, one of those mother's milk facts that we all take for granted about unique factorization of integers into primes. Uh, but in fact, that's a theorem that merits some proof uh, as an example in the homework shows where we exhibited a system of numbers which didn't factor uniquely. And finally, we will uh, be able to knock off the diehard story once and for all. So let's begin by stating the rules of the game. Um, we're going to assume all of the usual algebraic rules for addition and multiplication and subtraction. So you may know some of these rules have names, like the first equality is called distributivity of multiplication over plus, of times over plus, and then the second uh, rule here is called commutativity of multiplication. And uh, here are some more familiar rules. This is called associativity of multiplication. This is called the additive identity, a minus a is zero, or actually additive inverse, zero is the additive identity and minus a is the inverse of a. Um, a plus zero equals a is the definition of uh, zero being an additive identity. a plus one is greater than a. So these are all standard algebraic facts that we're gonna take for granted and not worry about. And one more fact that we also know um, and we're gonna take as an axiom, um, if I uh, divide a number, a positive number, uh, sorry, if I divide a number a by a positive number b, then when we're talking about integers, uh, what I'm going to get is a quotient and a remainder. What's the definition of the quotient and a remainder? Well, um, the division theorem says that if I divide uh, a by b, that means if I take the quotient times b plus the remainder, I get a. And in fact, there's a unique quotient of a divided by b, and this unique remainder of a divided by b, where the remainder, uh, what makes it unique is the remainder is constrained to be uh, in the interval greater than or equal to zero and less than the divisor b. So we're going to take this uh, fact for granted too. Um, proving it is not worth thinking about too hard because it's one of those facts that's so elementary that it's hard to think of other things that uh, would more legitimately prove it. I'm sure it could be proved by induction, but I haven't really thought that through. Okay, um, a key uh, relation that we're gonna be looking at today uh, is the relation of divisibility between uh, integers. So by the way, all of the variables for the next week or so are gonna be understood to range over the integers. So when I say number, I mean integer. When I talk about variables a and c and k, I mean that they're taking integer values. So I'm going to define c divides a using this vertical bar notation. It's read as divide. c divides a if and only if um, a is equal to k times c for some k. Um, and there are a variety of synonyms for a divides b, like uh, a is a... Uh, 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 a divides C, uh, sorry, C divides A um, is to say that A is a multiple of C um, and C is a divisor of A. Okay, let's just practice this. So 5 divides 15, well, because 15 is 3 times 5. Um, a number n divides 0, every number n divides 0, even 0 divides 0 because 0 is equal to 0 times n. So um, zero is a multiple of every number. Um, another trivial fact that follows from the definition is that if C divides A, then C divides any constant times A. Well, let's just check that out, how it follows from the definition. Um, 
if I'm given that C divides A, that means that A is equal to K prime C for some K prime. That implies that um, if I multiply both sides of this equality by S, I get that SA is equal to SK prime C. And if I parenthesize the SK prime, I can call that to be K. And I found, sure enough, that SA is a multiple of C. That's a trivial proof. We're just practicing with the definitions. Um, so we have just verified this fact that if C divides A, then C divides a constant times A. Um, as a matter of fact, if C divides A and C divides B, then C divides A plus B. Let's just check that one. Um, what we've got is C, uh, C divides A means that, um, uh, that uh, A is equal to K1 times C. And uh, C divides B means that B is equal to K2 times C. So that means that A plus B is simply K1 plus K2 times C, where what I've done is here is used the uh, distributivity uh, law to factor C out and use the fact that multiplication is commutative so I can factor out on either side. Okay, um, let's put those facts together. If C divides A and C divides B, then C divides SA plus TB where s and t are any integers at all. So a combination of two numbers a and b like this uh, uh, is called a linear combination of a and b, an integer linear combination. But since we're only talking about integers, I'm going to stop saying integer linear combination and just say linear combination. A linear combination of a and b is what you get by uh, uh, multiplying them by coefficients s and t and adding them. OK. Uh, so we've just figured out that, in fact, if C divides A and C divides B, then C divides an integer linear combination of B. When C divides two numbers, it's called a common divisor of those two numbers. So we could rephrase this observation by saying common divisors of A and B divide integer linear combinations of A and B, which is a good fact to just file away in your head. Now. What we're going to be focusing on for the rest of today is the concept of the greatest common divisor of A and B, called the GCD of A and B. Um, the greatest common divisor of A and B uh, exists by the well-ordering principle because uh, it's a set of non-negative integers with an upper bound. Um, namely, A is an upper bound on the greatest common divisor of A and B. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, as we did in an exercise, uh, or I think in the text, that implies that there will be a greatest one among all the common divisors, assuming there are any, um, but one is always a common divisor, so there, there are guaranteed to be some. Um, let's look at some examples. Um, the greatest common divisor of 10 and 12, you can check, it's 2. Uh, mainly because the 10 factors into 2 times 5 and 12 factors into uh, 2 times 6, and the 6 and the 5 have no common factors, so the only one that they share is 2. Uh, the GCD of 13 and 12 is 1. They have no common factors in, uh, in common. You can see that because 13 is a prime, and so uh, it has no uh, factors other than 1 and 13, and 13 doesn't divide 12 because it's too big, so it's got to be 1. The GCD of 17 and 17 is 17. That's a general phenomenon. The GCD of n and n is always n. The greatest common divisor of 0 and n uh, is equal to n for any positive n. That's because everything is a divisor of 0, and uh, it means the GCD of 0 and n is simply the greatest divisor of n, which is, of course, n by itself. One final fact to set things up for the next segment is to think about the GCD of a prime and a number, and it's either 1 or p. Uh, the reason is that the only divisors of a prime are plus minus 1 and plus minus p, so uh, if p divides a, the GCD is p, and otherwise the GCD is 1.